In terms of game theory, the figure of merit of a good game is minimum rules, maximum richness. And so using that metric, war is the ultimate game because minimum of rules, massive complexity, whole economies and peoples and cultures whacking it out. If you take the next best metric for game playing, it's business, where you have tremendous complexity, keep score with money, uh, market share, what have you, and, and it's really fun. And being a game player, looking at strategic as well as tactical decisions in, in business has always been really a lot of fun. A lot of people wondered why Atari with the 2600 was able to dominate the market so completely and so totally. And one of the reasons was that the consumer game space required in-channel capacity, which was a relatively trick technology at that time. Used, uh, you know, small scale, you know, had, had to be able to do very small uh, etchings and so, at the time, there were only five companies in the world that could do it, that had an in-channel process. So, since we were the first, I went around and I cut deals with every one of the in-channel houses to make me the next generation custom chip for the next generation Atari 2600. And these were exclusive. And so, basically, I knew that if I could tie up all of them, that nobody could compete with me <laughs> because there just wasn't any, anybody left. And so, uh, and it was costing us like fifty dollars to $100,000 a year. And I could constantly make just enough little changes that in the end channel world where it was all LSI, you know, any change set you back at least three to six months. And so I felt as long as I could keep this shell game going, it would be really great. I'd have, have totally isolated and dominated the marketplace. Well, after I sold the company and I was working this, this thing, uh, people say, why are you doing this? Well, you only need one next generation. You know, pick the guys that are the best and let these guys save, save you $100,000. I mean, you couldn't really tell them out loud that this is, this is a blocking strategy. Because, you know, business guys, particularly green eye shade people, don't, don't get that. They don't understand that for $100,000 to get a monopoly is really a cheap price. <laughs> really a cheap price. In terms of game theory, the figure of merit of a good game is minimum rules, maximum richness. And so using that metric, war is the ultimate game because minimum of rules, massive complexity, whole economies and peoples and cultures whacking it out. If you take the next best metric for game playing, it's business, where you have tremendous complexity, keep score with money, uh, market share, what have you, and, and it's really fun. And being a game player, Looking at strategic as well as tactical decisions in, in business has always been really a lot of fun. A lot of people wondered why Atari with the 2600 was able to dominate the market so completely and so totally. And one of the reasons was that the consumer game space required in-channel capacity which was a relatively trick technology at that time. Used, uh, you know, small scale, you know, had, had to be able to do very small uh, etchings. And so at the time, there were only five companies in the world that could do it, that had an in-channel process. So since we were the first, I went around and I cut deals with every one of the in-channel houses to make me the next generation custom chip for the next generation Atari 2600. And these were exclusive. And so 
basically I knew that if I could tie up all of them, that nobody could compete with me <laughs> because there just wasn't any, anybody left. And so, uh, and it was costing us like fifty dollars to $100,000 a year. And I could constantly make just enough little changes that in the end channel world where it was all LSI, you know, any change set you back at least three to six months. And so I felt as long as I could keep this shell game going, it would be really great and I'd have, have totally isolated and dominated the marketplace. Well, after I sold the company when I was working this, this thing, uh, people say, why are you doing this? You, know, you only need one next generation. You know, pick the guys that are the best and let these guys save, save you $100,000. Well, you couldn't really tell them out loud that this is, this is a blocking strategy. Because, you know, business guys, particularly green eye shade people, don't, don't get that. They don't understand that for $100,000 to get a monopoly is really a cheap price. <laughs> really a cheap price. In terms of game theory, the figure of merit of a good game is minimum rules, maximum richness. And so, using that metric, war is the ultimate game because minimum of rules, massive complexity, whole economies and peoples and cultures whacking it out. If you take the next best metric for game playing, it's business, where you have tremendous complexity, keep score with money, uh, market share, what have you, and, and it's really fun. And being a game player, Looking at strategic as well as tactical decisions in, in business has always been really a lot of fun. A lot of people wondered why Atari with the 2600 was able to dominate the market so completely and so totally. And one of the reasons was that the consumer game space required in-channel capacity which was a relatively trick technology at that time. Used, uh, you know, small scale, you know, had, had to be able to do very small uh, etchings. And so at the time, there were only five companies in the world that could do it, that had an in-channel process. So since we were the first, I went around and I cut deals with every one of the in-channel houses to make me the next generation custom chip for the next generation Atari 2600. And these were exclusive. And so basically I knew that if I could tie up all of them, that nobody could compete with me <laughs> because there just wasn't any, anybody left. And so, uh, and it was costing us like fifty dollars to $100,000 a year. And I could constantly make just enough little changes that in the end channel world where it was all LSI, you know, any change set you back at least three to six months. And so I felt as long as I could keep this shell game going, it would be really great and I'd have, have totally isolated and dominated the marketplace. Well, after I sold the company when I was working this, this thing, uh, People say, why are you doing this? You, know, you only need one next generation. You know, pick the guys that are the best and let these guys save, save you $100,000. Well, you couldn't really tell them out loud that this is, this is a blocking strategy. Because you know, business guys, particularly green eye shade people, don't, don't get that. They don't understand that for $100,000 to get a monopoly is really a cheap price. <laughs> really a cheap price. In terms of game theory, the figure of merit of a good game is minimum rules, maximum richness. And so using that metric, my favorite game of all time, Go. I mean, it's, uh, I used to, I played number two board for the University of Utah chess and the minute I discovered Go, my fascination with chess left.
and it's just a wonderfully rich and powerful game. And I still think it's one of those classics that, uh, that cannot be uh, beaten in terms of, of richness and, and excitement. It turned out that if you had a something about the mass of a of a pool ball, which of course you never have in a bar, <laughs> and you hit the third bolt down on the left side of the coin mech, it would set up a harmonic vibration and you'd get a free game. And literally, uh, whenever it's possible to cheat and get a free game, the world knows about it in about a femtosecond from the first person who discovers it. I mean, the, the, there's a network. And this is before the, the internet, but it's, it's an incredible. And, uh, and so you hear it from the, the field, hey, the machines have quit earning money because people are getting games free. What are you going to do about it? And so you put your engineering hat on. You figure out what the problem is. You put dampers in and, and a, a slam switch and a couple of things in the circuit, and you eliminate it. The other one that happened is in dry climates, if they happen to be placed on a... Uh, carpet and if you could really, really um, get a big electrical charge and if you hit, in this case, it was the top bolt, you'd get a, a spark that would go through and it would reset the machine and about one in three times it would start, start the machine. Well, we saw people doing what became known as the, uh, the Atari shuffle and if the place didn't have carpet, they would put on nylon jackets and rub against each other <laughs> to get a, get a charge up. And, um, and that was a much harder one to do because the, you know, these high voltage things would go all throughout the digital stuff. We were able to get that one solved as well. There was a very clever system in which uh, the person, the, the guy running the machines found that uh, the counter had counted coins, but when he'd look in the cash box, there'd be nothing there. And uh, one time he noticed that there was a little bit of moisture in the bottom. And so he staked out the machines and found out that some little kids, some nine, ten years old, had taken modeling clay, made impressions of quarters, filled them with water, and then put them in, a, uh, in the freezer with a little bit of sand or, or other things to make them a little bit heavier. Then they put on their wagon an ice chest, went down to the local bowling alley, and they would quickly run in with these little disks of ice, put it in the coin mech, and it would trigger a free game. I think that whenever you go back to places that have historical roots for you, it's, it allows you to sort of vicariously relive some of the, the past fun times that you had. I mean, these were, these were heady times. These were really, really, um, the world was in turmoil. The business was in its infancy. I mean, a lot of times the, uh, the underpinnings for what later became the personal computer business were really being placed here. You know, that sort of stuff. There are all these links and connections. And uh, it's, in some ways, a little tiny bit frustrating because there was a time in the personal computer business where I knew everything that was happening. I knew the microprocessor, I knew the clock speeds, I knew everything. I knew every hard drive that was available and then all of a sudden it just goes like this. And, and, and so that, that feeling of control and, and, and an understanding just goes away. If you blink, all of a sudden the whole segment of the business moves in another direction. The games were fun because they had to be simple enough. The, the world was naive about video games. There wasn't a long learning curve. And unlike the video game, the coin-operated video game business today in which very few people play games. I mean, if you were to go down and ask a random number of people, when was the last time you put a quarter in a coin machine to play a video game, the number's pretty small. And what really happened is the games were very accessible to anyone because they were simple to play and yet challenging and fun. Um, later on, the business 
moved away from that, and the games got kept getting compl more complex and more difficult to play. If a typical person wandered into an arcade today, with the possible exception of a driving game, they'd be hard pressed to play a, a fight, punch kick fight game and do any, any good. They're very difficult. The greatest achievements, I believe, fall into sort of two different categories. One is sort of technical prog progress. The other side is sort of the game thought and, 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 and direction. I think if you go down the technical side, you have to start with the first phase of game development. It was really on big, massive computers that were non-economic, but there were some interesting things done. Uh, space Wars is the, probably the pinnacle of development in that space. Then the Atari side really created what I call state machines. These were not, they used computer chips, but they weren't strictly von Neumann machines, which is a technical term for a machine that, that executes a program. Um, and then that phase stayed until Asteroids. And Asteroids was the first uh, coin-operated video game that had a microprocessor in it. And in that case, the microprocessor still wasn't fast enough, so it basically did a lot of the calculations, but you still had a huge number of chips that, were, that you had to do the interface with. From there, you go to consumer pong and the consumer side of the marketplace, which condensed everything into one chip, which allowed cost and reliability to be good enough that you could go in the home. So that's sort of, I think, a technical breakthrough. Um, and then the Stella in the 2600, which worked with a microprocessor to make a reprogrammable game. And that was where the cartridge uh, economic model was set up, which really allowed a razor, razor blade thing, because we made very little money on the hardware but we made a lot of money on the software. And that's sort of been the metaphor for the gaming, for the consumer game business ever since. Um, then in terms of technology after that on the coin op side, um, it's been just evolution of bigger, faster, better, faster processors, uh, better use of memory, uh, able to manipulate more and more polygons, which is sort of the standard litmus test of what is good. If you climb over on the, on the software, the entertainment side, you sort of go from what I'd call primitive black and white kind of boxy stuff to the point where you now are creating pretty realistic objects. Um, there was sort of the ball and paddle game phase of the marketplace, then there was the driving game phase, which is, is continuing on. And then you got into a, a point in time where there were these object games, these uh, puzzle games, um, like Pac-Man and, and uh, uh, Centipede and uh, some of these old wonderful classics that, in which you were sort of gathering and packing and chasing and running and, and everything against time. Uh, then there was this other thread that was sort of starting at the same time on the computers, which was probably started by Colossal Cave, and that was the role-playing, game-playing, uh, uh, action-adventure, where you were actually in a long-form game. This is, this is a game where you can play for days and days and days. And I actually think that was a very uh, important uh, milestone that uh, which has really spawned the mists and ribbons and, and a lot of the other uh, genres that are, have been popularized by Sierra and, and some of the other games like uh, companies like that. Um, on the uh, on the action adventure side, uh, the arcades have always been very good because they had good user interfaces. 
the home game side has always been plagued with bad user interfaces. <laughs> and, you know, not nearly as good. I mean, it's not as much fun to play a driving game with a joystick than it is to have a, st a steering wheel and a gear shift and a gas pedal. And so that's, uh, you're starting to get that more and more available in the home, but it comes at a price. I think that uh, the home game and the console games and then the divergence of the computer side was also another very important part because the computer allowed for a lot more creativity because programmers could, without a huge budget, come up with something that was really wonderful in the, uh, in the computer environment where it was much more difficult uh, on the home game side because the manufacturers are always creating huge barriers to entry because they want to control the marketplace. And so uh, I believe that we have much richer and more powerful games and the game space is more uh, interesting in the computer side because of that freedom. I think it's wonderful that the power today allows you to totally emulate uh, the things that were very difficult to do many, many years ago. And so that it gives access to anyone. These, uh, these games which, you know, like a you know, fine wine in old bottles or classics, uh, whether it be music or others, I believe that some of these games are classics and will continue to have play value forever. And, uh, and I think that uh, like so many times in the movie field and that sometimes the emulation is a step, but then there's a chance for sequels in which you take the basic gameplay and upgrade it to the, to the current uh, uh, market standard of color and sound and what have you. The mainframes were actually connected. Um, there were four places in the world, MIT, Stanford, University of Utah, and the University of Minnesota. Uh, and these were not traditional television screens. These were more like big oscilloscopes. I mean, they called them ras uh, vector displays as opposed to raster displays. And uh, they were very easy to program games which were very, very simple um, because you could draw vectors. But as you draw, drew more and more of them, the refresh time would, would slow down and all of a sudden it'd start to flicker. So as long as you kept the, the number of objects you were drawing to a small number, you'd get good results. Um, and then what, uh, what Pong did in, in the first phase was to really bring it to the low cost monitors that you had in your home and because of mass production they were cheap. As an example, a vector monitor in those days cost $15,000 and whereas you could use a TV set for 100 and that was kind of the, one of the metaphors that allowed it to be uh, everywhere instead of a few specialized computer centers. When I first started out, my plan was to take a mini computer which had just come down in price. I mean, we always thought of the, the very first time I thought of putting a game in an arcade, you take a seven million dollar computer and divide it by the number of quarters you have to put in and the math doesn't work. Uh, and so then many computers were 40,000 and then 30,000 and then all of a sudden across my desk came one that was uh, under, under 10,000. And I said, aha, I bet I can do this. But my idea was to use one mini computer and run several displays so that I'd have more coin slots so I could put it in, our, in amusement parks and things like that and make enough money to amortize this $8,000, $10,000 machine. Um, what happened was I kept running out of cycle time. The computers were just too slow to keep all the, I think we were starting out with six and then I went down to five and went down to four and if I went down to three, I knew that the machine couldn't make enough money to really pay for itself. So that was kind of a, that was kind of a watershed. So I had to get it 
to work with four. And so in order to do that, I had to keep making the terminals smarter, have them do more of the work. For example, in, uh, in computer space, there was a star field. Well, it, you chewed up a lot of compute time if you calculated the star field by itself. So I just figured out a way to put random dots up. And it didn't, rec it didn't correspond to any known galaxy, but hey, it's OK. <laughs> and uh, things like that. Um, but I kept running out of cycle time, even on the, the calculating where the ships were and, and interrogating the joysticks and all that sort of thing. And so I basically abandoned the project. I said, you know, this won't work. I've got to wait until the prices come down some more. And then sort of out of the blue, one late at night, uh, I said, why don't I get rid of the mini computer entirely and do it all in hardware? And that was the breakthrough that really created the launch. Pong was never considered to be a viable product at the outset. It was considered to be a training project for Al Alcorn, who was my first engineering hire. And I felt that uh, some of the things that we were working on, and I had a contract to do a, a driving game, which was quite difficult. Um, I thought it was too big of a reach, and so I just wanted him to get his feet wet by doing a simple game. And so I said, ball going left to right, paddles going up and down when you hit the ball. Um, and he did it and, and was able to, to finish the, the initial board in about a week and a half. I mean, it was, he was very good. We were actually planning to have a little guy with a paddle that you'd place it with the knob, and then you'd push the button, and the paddle would go there. And, and if you hit it too soon, it'd go up. And if you hit it too late, it'd go down, and so on. Um, but we got the, the paddle on there, and we decided to just have it bounce off the paddle. Uh, we didn't call it the paddle that time. It was the part that was going to turn into the little player. and. Uh, the game was fun, and so we said, hey, no need to gild the lily. This is good enough. We used um, this. It was called Andy Cap's Tavern at the time. One, because I knew the owner. Two, because we had uh, already placed uh, computer space in here. And this was kind of a mecca for not the suits part of Silicon Valley, but the techie parts of Silicon Valley. and. Uh, and computer space earned a lot of money in that environment. And so it was very easy to call up Bill and say, hey, I'd like to test Pong here. Um, and he said, sure, bring it in. We had just put it in a little box. It was about like this, with a, the, the kind of cash box that you see on kiddie rides, just glued to the side. And uh, we actually placed the box on a barrel. And that was the very first Pong unit. We had put the first unit on test right in this very establishment, uh, right over there. And, uh, and that was when the famous story about the service call and the service call being that the cash box had completely filled up and the, ca and the quarters would backed up through the, the coin mech. True story. Um, and when I heard that, I thought to myself, hmm, and I Figured, looked at all the money we had in the world, and it was just enough to make 11. So we bought the parts for 11, build up, and never looked back. It was doing so well, I said, if I can't sell these 11, I can collect enough money just by putting them on location that um, I know I can pay for the parts and all the other things and, and, and keep the company running. And it was, I, you know, very clear that you license something and you get a 5, 10, 15 percent royalty. Um, actually, with hardware, you very seldom got more than a 7 percent royalty. And yet, there was a 50 percent, 60 percent gross margin possible. So you do a quick calculation and say, that's a better part of the business. <laughs> it was a total smash hit. In fact, people started coming in early so they could get time on the machines. And that was the first time I ever saw quarters lined along to uh, reserve a space, which cool. has sort of become part of the mythology of video game sites.
First of all, it was simple. And anyone could play, and yet it stretched you, because we did the speed up algorithm so that no matter how good you got, you will ultimately miss it. But there was another factor that happened that uh, I think was very special. And that factor was that it became socially acceptable for a woman to ask a man to come play Pong with her. Women were very good at the game. It was something about the manual dexterity of the, of the knob. And, um, and I think that uh, it was uh, a, a great social experience that was going on. The number of people that have told me uh, in the last 25 years that they met their husband or wife playing Pong, it's been in the hundreds. Well, if not me, somebody else would have, uh, maybe a little bit later. But uh, I think that in some ways it was serendipity. I think uh, I happened to have an engineering degree uh, and have video computer experience simultaneously with working summers at an amusement park. So I knew the economics of the business. Um, and so putting those things together was relatively simple in, in some ways. And how I happened to be an electrical engineer working in an amusement park, it was an accident in space and time. <laughs> I did feel that there were going to be uh, games in most homes, video games. Um, one of my big disappointments was that I felt that the technology that we were developing was going to fundamentally revolutionize education. Because um, I felt that it was such a powerful and inexpensive communication medium that applied to the job of learning that there could be some really uh, uh, powerful strides. I still believe that, but it will not happen uh, in, in the environment of a school monopoly. <laughs> you know, you've got it basically get competition and then technology can really rise to the fore. The 4004, which is the Intel first microprocessor, um, was so slow. I mean, it was the first one and, and, and it couldn't possibly have run a video game. And I think that it was invented uh, just a couple of years after. But uh, there wasn't a single microprocessor in a coin-operated video game until 1975-76. So we, we built a lot of video games in, in the interim. And these were all state machines. We tried to sell Pong um, for probably four months before we sold any. We took it to the toy show and uh, got no response. It, uh, we took it to, you know, all kinds of, of appliance chains, not a single taker. Took all the toy chains, not a single taker. And we thought we had a, a, a real turkey on our hands. And yet we knew when we talked to customers that, they, that there was a, a, a demand for it, that we could sell them to people. But how do you get distribution? I mean, because uh, the toy store said it's too expensive for us. $29.95 is the highest price thing that we have in our stores. You go to the appliance departments and they say, we can't have a $99 product because people want to finance it and we don't think it's going to be lasting that long. So we, we, can't, we can't do that. And so um, the breakthrough came with a single buyer at Sears Roebuck who uh, we just called after we'd gotten turned down in the Sears Roebuck toy department. We got turned down by the Sears Roebuck appliance department. And he'd heard about it. And, uh, and he said, and, and the previous Christmas, he had done a big job in home pool tables. And this Christmas, he said, ah, pool tables, pool tables in bars. What are else in there? And so he'd done a deal with somebody to, that did an electromechanical pinball machine. He says, ah, and video games are in bars. Let me give it a try. And so he, we called him up, and he 
showed up on our doorstep the next day and said, how many can you produce? We thought we could produce maybe 25, 30,000. So we said 70,000. <laughs> and, uh, and he came back with an order for 150,000. And we said, there's just no way uh, we can fund that. We just don't have the money. He says, don't you worry. Um, I'll introduce you to Sears Bank, which he did. And uh, we, um, and then they advanced us 80% of the, of the sales price the day, the minute the unit fell off the end of the line into a bonded warehouse that we had. And so all of a sudden we had the funding and, you know, if you have the money, you can figure out how to make 150,000. I actually think we made almost, uh, almost 200,000 that year. 